building should work from the inside out. You know, I don't think that you design an exterior and fit an interior into it. I used to like doing a big central space and fitting, fitting things kind of around it and relating to the, to the core and, and the outside as much as you can reflects what the inside is. It's a kind of theme that I've played uh, a number of times. Sean uh, moved to, to Canada from England. Uh, he lived in a small town that uh, eventually became a, a part of London and he attended uh, an architectural school. Uh, he, he said it was either that or going to the Royal Navy and uh, his preference was, uh, was architecture. You know, I don't really know why it was that, uh, that I wanted to be an architect, but, but I was quite young when, when, I, when I, you know, decided that's what I wanted to be. I think it was about 14 or 15. I was encouraged by an, an art master who was one of the great influences, I think, in, in my life. Um, went to Kingston uh, School of Architecture, graduated at the end of 56. I worked for a year in, uh, in central London where I worked exclusively on large office buildings. I think I spent six months doing toilets and rear entries and Lyons coffee houses. And uh, decided that I'd like to move to Canada. I was married came to Canada within a week to, uh, to Edmonton, no job, um, only to find that in 57 there was a recession in the building industry and the last thing that people wanted was, was an English architect without Canadian experience. There was uh, uh, an opportunity or an advertisement for, uh, for an architect needed in Saskatoon. Came here for an interview, um, started the next month. Well, after the two years, I started practice on my own. And things were going great for a couple of years, but then work dried up a little bit. I decided that I was going to go back to, uh, to England. I was a member of the, the symphony board here in Saskatoon, and the, uh, the chairman of the board was uh, Cole McEwen, who was uh, vice president of the, of the university. And I was chatting to him, saying that you know, there'd be a vacancy on the board because I was going to move back to England. He said, well, would you, would you stay around if you've got a decent job on, on campus? And I said, sure, I would. And uh, got a call uh, about a week later, come in for an interview, um, and, uh, and the project was buildings for the Colleges of Law and Commerce on the, on the campus. Modernism carries a connotation of, uh, you know, of, of Le Corbusier and stark white surfaces, and that certainly isn't isn't what I would feel. But I would agree that it, it's it's architecture of our time, not period, not not harking back to a previous period, which a lot of postmodern architecture does. So I, I certainly wouldn't call my stuff postmodern, but but neither is it modern, you know. As I think the, the the best way of of thinking of it is thinking of it as contemporary architecture, architecture of our time. The first commission I did for the university was um, a dining hall at MLA. I recall it had a suspended fireplace in the in the center of it you know, with seating all around in, I think, two levels, pit under the fire. But that was a very pleasant job to do. John was probably the most successful architect on campus, uh, certainly uh, in his generation, uh, at the integration and, and uh, respect of the collegiate Gothic uh, with this uh, modern or, or postmodern approach to architecture. The College of Law and the Commerce Development that John did a number of years ago really is one of my favorite pieces on campus. Uh, I think John was able to take some, some very traditional ideas about campus buildings and school buildings and, and put them in a modern milieu that really works well on this campus and, and gave this building a, a simple elegance. I can remember the first day I came to the law school for an interview many years ago. It's quite inspiring when you walk in. It's a really striking 
a piece of architecture. Uh, Holiday Scott was the architect and his postmodern ideas uh, that are reflected in this building have led to this being designated as a heritage building. The outside, the fortress-like look, um, people recognize it on campus. Uh, it, it is in keeping with the rest of the campus. It was very cleverly done. You know, we have the same stone, but yet it is distinctive. It does look like a fortress with the light coming in from above, <laughs> the divine, I suppose. I got the feeling uh, that central to the, to the law building was, uh, was a law library. You know, like almost everything related to the, uh, you know, to the law library then, of course, all books. The original idea was to organize, if you will, the building itself around this commons that you see below us, that this was the intellectual heart of the building and where the students worked, where they gleaned their information from the books, uh, the law books, where they studied, where they engaged in discussion about the law. And we started at that level, moved up to the classroom level, which surrounded on the mezzanine, but again, open to the floor below. And then on the third level would be the professors. Since that time, I've heard several students, though, uh, in all honesty, refer to it as more like, at, at times, like San Quentin, when they look up and they see the guards on the third floor circulating around, looking down on the prisoners below. But I think that's mainly during exam time that we hear that comment. The second part of that project, of course, is, is the commerce building. You know, there's a commerce classroom wing and a commerce office building. So the idea was that uh, you design these parts almost as, as individual pavilions with a glass link in between each of them. On the law school it was poured concrete with this waffle produced by uh, steel pans laying on forms which produces these kind of coffered ceiling. There's a ring of of kind of lancet windows all the way around the top of the uh, the law building, which gives that kind of nice, nice kind of softish light, which you gain by making kind of very deep reveals, so that more light kind of reflects than than is direct. The amazing thing about that lantern is that at 40 below on a beautiful sunny day in Saskatoon, the light is streaming into this room, uh, down into the library. You know, many libraries tend to be sort of dingy and dark and you lose sort of contact with the outside world, have no idea what's going on. The lantern at the top has always given us an opportunity to be aware of the environment which surrounds the law school. The only feature in the middle of, of that space is book stacks, which are you know, deliberately kept down with very low ceiling heights, you know, something like seven feet. It's nice to contrast uh, kind of smooth colour with textured material. And in, in that case, I think we used a kind of a ribbed concrete, uh, concrete block, which was painted off-white. And all oak, which seemed, seemed appropriate, you know, this, this kind of institutional oak. The books provided, uh, you know, quite a kind of a varied colour uh, accent to that building too. Well, the uh, Lutheran Seminary uh, building is is uh, my favourite. I think largely because uh, he he did capture the essence of a uh, medieval monastery in the design of this building. He was just so thorough and consistent in the way he uh, delivered a building. The design was uh, was really true. Actually, before the law building was finished, um, got the commission for the uh, for the seminary. That was uh, an interesting building to do. I wanted to do this thing out of uh, precast concrete, very rigid kind of material, and something that was, um, if not pliable, at least very kind of individual and, and various, uh, like uh, like fieldstone. So they're the three elements, the uh, academic, which is kind of centered again on the library, the chapel at the end, which, uh, which we did by sloping these precast elements in at a, a kind of an angle to get this almost Gothic kind of shape to the chapel, and the residential, which of course is, is smaller scale, but a bigger building, and fitted it all around a courtyard with a dean's residence kind of as a, a little counterpoint. Pools, landscaping, the lot actually worked out very nicely. The space that we're sitting in the chapel uh, is designed uh, to provide the sort of acoustic uh, properties that you would find in uh, a medieval uh, cathedral.
There's a lot of reverberation uh, from any point. It's fairly easy to, to hear, so there isn't a need to, to raise your voice. So there, there really is a sense of uh, uh, awe, peace. I think uh, you know, people really appreciate this space. He also uh, developed the idea of cloisters. And again, in this building, in the Lutheran Seminary, if you go out onto the riverside, uh, there is an external courtyard, uh, which is enclosed with a, a series of uh, garden walls. And medieval architecture uh, uh, did cloistered uh, spaces with walls that were effectively battlements protect the inhabitants and a lot of universities are designed on the same notion. You uh, keep the rabble out uh, so that you can focus on uh, what it is you're supposed to be doing. The best way to see it is, is to walk along the riverbank along the Wasin Trail. You kind of uh, get to see the, the heart of the building rather than its kind of uh, corporate face that you see from the, uh, you know, from the roadside. There were many architects in town who went through uh, John's office uh, and uh, trained with the masters. I, I always like to draw and sketch and, uh, and I like math and apparently those are the two things that, are, that lend you well for going into architecture. Uh, I never thought I'd ever be an architect though. I, I went to a technical high school where drafting was part of the course and uh, out of high school I got a job uh, working for one of the local firms, Federated Cooperatives. Uh, at about that time, John was very busy uh, just starting to work on law commerce and he needed some, some slaves to help him out and, uh, and he approached Federated Co-op and uh, I started working with him in 1964. And after uh, working with John for a couple of years, totally mystified at what this architecture was all about, uh, I thought I'd better go back to school and learn a bit about it so we could even talk to each other on an intelligent level. Uh, most architects will sketch, reconsider, uh, redesign, and it's an iterative process. Uh, John didn't do that. He'd sort of go away, mull over the thing. Then he'd spend uh, a 24-hour period, and at the end of it, he'd uh, have a full sketch set. He would work on, on sketchbooks like this and develop the entire project in these sketchbooks. Uh, he had an uncanny ability to draw to scale, uh, so you could almost trace these drawings and put them on as a finished drawing. So I think that's a remarkable capability. Uh, you know, he had a spatial perception that uh, would challenge any architects, I think. That was the first project that I worked on with John after I finished my architectural degree. The main focus of the design was, of course, it was to house the College of Dentistry, but also the building was designed to be a walkway through that transition from the working part of the campus, like the university hospital uh, and to the academic part. And so a, a central mall on the main level was created in that building. And again, we did quite a bit of research. What you wanted to do was not make the, uh, a dental student feel that, uh, that he was one of a hundred or more people all stuck in a you know, kind of uh, identical cubicle but make them feel that their particular uh, kind of little suite was, was almost complete in itself, even though it had to be, you know, a kind of part of a, a, of a whole general area, but give it individuality. The teaching clinic is, a, is, a, is an open space, um, like an atrium space, uh, which one is one of the features of a lot of John's designs, uh, building an atrium space that that actually connects all the parts of the building together, uh, focusing in a, in a central, or what we called on that building, the heart of the building. You can make people feel calmer, which is probably what you want to do for, for the patients. As opposed to that, the people that spend all their time there are the, are, the, are the students and faculty. And for them, you don't want to calm them down all the time. We used a vinyl floor with a kind of fairly pronounced pattern on, on the floor, which I like to do. It helps to kind of bring down the scale, you know, from, from big room to, uh, to the immediate surrounding. 
white concrete, white walls mostly. And you might remember the, uh, the kind of dispensary area in the, in the center, the one that, uh, that's got these uh, kind of stainless steel cylinders on which actually contain the lights that uh, give the indirect light in that, in that room. So you, you probably notice these uh, these suns at uh, at the ends of the uh, of the main clinic. And on that one, John and I had just come back from some work in the West Indies, and uh, uh, we'd been exposed to so much of that sun coming up and down, and uh, a bit of influence of that working uh, two weeks in the West Indies is, is in that building. He uh, has used a technique that uh, has been in use for centuries and centuries, and that is the uh, application of, of three uh, layers or materials. The, the base or the plinth is done in a, a rough, heavy stone, and again, that's consistent with the uh, collegiate Gothic uh, style or, or expression on the campus. Uh, as he goes up in his buildings, uh, there is a secondary level, uh, which is uh, you know, quite light, uh, a lot of glazing and some degree of transparency. And then the upper level is expressed largely in, in a smoother stone, uh, the sort of smooth cut Tyndall stone. With the Administration Humanities Building on the University of Regina, the Commons is, is the central space. In fact, <laughs> more, more kind of relates to that central space uh, or atrium in that building in Regina than any other one I've done, I think. So he is quite daring in, in the way he dealt with his, his stairs. The stair tends to be a, a major feature in, uh, in much of the work that John has done. And uh, the focus you know, within the, the central courtyard spaces in his buildings. I do think that he likes the drama of a cantilever. I believe that the balance has been tremendous, uh, visual and uh, of course structural. You've got to deal with the physical uh, realities of, of the structure. I had a, a, a very good structural engineer um, on that. This guy really got into the idea of, of you know, having, having this central space, particularly with the, you know, the council chamber, kind of hung right over the middle of, uh, of this big open space and skylights all around it. And it wasn't easy to engineer, I'm sure. The Wascana Centre came to our office as a result of a competition amongst architects in Saskatchewan. Well, we came in second the architects who came in first, uh, produced the, the, the detailed design, went out to tender, it was way over budget. Uh, Wascana Authority had another look at their budget, reprogrammed the area, came to us and said, this, this is what we have for our budget, and this is what we want design. If you can do it for that, it's, the job's yours. It was more than the normal architectural commission. It was almost total control and interior design. It was a great building to work on. The object was really to make the building feel like it was as natural as the earth shape, but of course the earth shapes are not natural either, really. They're, they're created. My concept of it was um, almost building it on a mound because I, I wanted the feeling of kind of going into it, almost like going into it through a tunnel. The other objective of, of using these earth berms were that we, we could conceal the um, uh, semi-industrial part of that building. We broke it up by surrounding the central space with these four towers. And because they were so important inside, kind of forming and framing the, the central space, I thought they should be expressed outside. Again, it's a, it's a building that works from a, a central space. The central feature is a sculpture hung from the very center of the building, one that uh, Eli Bornstein did of the seasons, which you know seemed an appropriate kind of uh, thing for Wascana. That was a riot of color as it was originally finished. I liked it best when it was that way. It's been toned down a little since. In, in fact, I, I, I did the toning down. We were commissioned just about two years ago now, I guess, to do an expansion to the existing College of Law building at the University of Saskatchewan. The expansion to, to the existing building really was a significant challenge. It, it is such a pure and, and elegant architectural piece. It was interesting, when we were initially commissioned, there was a concept plan that had been developed by the university itself. 
And, and that concept plan would have taken all of the traffic of the students and faculty into the expansion uh, outboard of the existing buildings. We came to the conclusion very, very uh, early in the process that we needed to take people back into what was designed as the heart of that facility. And, and so we moved the connection point. We, we created a path of travel that would take everybody back through the heart of the building, which is the library space itself. It was probably the single most important decision that we made. And then to find a way to touch the building as delicately as we could, what we came up with was the concept of a, a new building that would be located south of, of the existing piece, and really just a small bridge that links it. Uh, it's connected by what is the heart of the expansion, the student space, uh, a, a large room that celebrates their position in this, in this faculty and their place in the building, and, and then a very delicate connection to the building. You can see behind me the stone wall that was retained. Uh, we did as little as possible to the existing building so that the, the integrity of the architectural piece was retained. Since we were sort of a, a partner, an equal partner in this, we felt that we had a role in designing the building, in, uh, in following through on the construction. We've been actively involved with the architects, with facilities management on campus, probably overly so in their opinion, but when you deal with a bunch of lawyers, it's pretty hard to push us to the side. We make our views known quite uh, vociferously at times. We started out with this idea of the heart of the building, and we didn't want to lose that, but it's very difficult to do when you're talking about an addition. Number one, we wouldn't, didn't want it to look like an addition. Um, so many times you, come, you, you go by a building and you say, well, there's the old and there's the new attached because of the lovely vinyl siding or whatever. And so we were extremely uh, conscious of the fact that this building, as a postmodern structure, as a heritage building, had to be complemented by whatever we did. LEAD is, uh, stands for uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, which is a commitment to a total sustainability solution. So the mandate of this building was to achieve what is called a LEAD Gold certification. We have a, a super building envelope. We have a, a very small mechanical system, heating and cooling system, uh, because the building is so thermally protected. Uh, we have daylight into every occupied space. We took very much advantage, I hope, of the, of the lead idea of natural light. The students, when they listed their priorities, that was number one. Um, they wanted classrooms wherein light came in. Well, they've been spoiled with the lantern. The faculty here were very committed to achieving a lead standard very early in the process. And, and one of the, the items that they latched onto very quickly was the notion of a green roof. Having a, a growing medium on the roof of the building that would allow us to put plants in. Uh, we're really excited about that. It's the first green roof in Saskatchewan. Um, I believe it's about 15,000 plants that went in. And we have a green roof that covers approximately 60% of the roof of this building. The reasons for, for the green roof are, are many fold. One is the simple protection of a roof membrane and making sure it's not exposed to ultraviolet rays and the damage of the sun. It has a significant reduction on, on heating in the building so our cooling load is reduced significantly. We're going to have signage over the lead features uh, in the building. I believe we've re reduced water consumption, expected water consumption by approximately 57 percent. We're going to tell all the students that. The green roof in terms of the uh, impacts on the infrastructure of the university and ultimately into the river has been amazing because we're retaining the water on site rather than simply flushing it into the storm stormwater sewage system. So a lot of this is going to require a little bit of education, but we're pretty excited about it. And, the, and as soon as you talk to the students about it, they're extremely pumped. They're very excited about having this you know, very cool building. It's worked out as a wonderful partnership between the law school and the university, and something hopefully that maybe we can take a little bit of credit for as something of a legacy for the rest of campus, because you now hear you know, of other people on campus coming over here and wanting to know more about the lead process. One, one of the things that we often lose sight of as architects is the impact that we're having on so many people. Every building we do, every installation we do, every time we, we, we change the landscape, we change the way people around it behave and people within it behave. We can never lose sight of that and never lose sight of the importance the work that we do has on, on the social fabric. In fact, I'm kind of amazed that uh, John isn't uh, recognized as one of the, the very best in the world. The most remarkable thing about John to me is that his buildings were fresh when they were initially designed and they were timeless. So you can look at one built 20 years ago and you could swear that it, it was just built last year. Last spring at the 
annual general meeting of the Saskatchewan Association of Architects, we honored John uh, with a life membership. He's a very thoughtful man and uh, brilliant. As for the future of architecture, I, um, I've seen many clever um, postmodern buildings. He would ask the architect, uh, why did you do that? And he wouldn't know. You know, this is, this is architecture without morality. So no, I don't think it's going in, in the right direction. But I think that designers have a, a moral duty to make their designs, their, the environment that they create, as pleasant, as proportionate, maybe as even as stimulating as, as, as they can. In the, the early work that, uh, that we recognize had a firm grasp on what uh, is referred to as postmodernist architecture. In uh, 1966, uh, an architect uh, out of California named Robert Venturi wrote a book called Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. And in it, he argued that uh, modernism should be challenged with the various sources of historic uh, ornamentation, uh, materials, um, forms, and uh, effectively uh, bring a, a messy element back into architecture or at least uh, uh, some uh, sense of uh, the complexity of architecture and of course as the, the name of the book implied, uh, some contradiction as well. And uh, John seemed to have a, a full handle on that uh, well before Venturi had, had written this. So it was really quite exceptional. Uh, the, the idea behind uh, uh, consistency and, and cohesion in campus planning, I believe, has always intended to, to capture something of the collegiate Gothic. Uh, the, the challenge, of course, uh, is, is to express a clear and obvious collegiate Gothic style uh, without sort of cheap historicism and we, we don't want to replicate buildings uh, entirely but uh, I know I think he did a very nice job of interpreting the collegiate gothic and uh, one of our objectives is that uh, anyone walking onto the campus should be able to recognize any building as part of an ensemble. Uh, John uh, tended to uh, work with themes, at least in the uh, university campus buildings that he did. Uh, he had medieval references uh, throughout, whether they be moats, <clears throat> as is quite evident uh, in all three of the buildings, particularly this one and the dental college, uh, some clear uh, allusions to, to moats. You'll notice that in the, uh, the College of Law complex, He's expressed some battlements and uh, introduced uh, sort of slot windows that, uh, that appear like the, the gun slots you'll, uh, you'll see, or arrow slots. 
uh, in you know, age-old buildings. He's also developed uh, in the, the law building uh, some finials, or at least you know what refer back to say the, the finials, uh, the uh, the upright sort of spires uh, that exist on the 1924 Thorvaldsen building. So he was really a master in, in sort of interpreting uh, the collegiate Gothic style, you know, within a modernist or, or postmodernist uh, idiom. So I think he was a brilliant man. Still is. Loved his sense of humor and. Uh, he, uh, he's a very gracious man as well. I uh, really love to hang around with him. He was uh, an extremely dedicated to the profession, uh, very uh, English and businesslike in the office. Uh, and uh, I think he often intimidated clients when he first met them, as he did with me when I first came to work with him. But as you got to know him, and, uh, and you kind of uh, jumped on that architecture bandwagon of his, he kind of uh, beguiled you with, uh, with, with the whole thing. And, uh, and um, he, we worked very hard for John. And for this thing about architecture, uh, uh, John's normal day was, uh, um, he would come into the office maybe 10 or 11 o'clock, and uh, he would bring his little sketch pad in and go over this, the work that he'd been doing on the previous night on the project that you were working on. He was always ahead of you on the project. So he was always thinking ahead of the time. So you weren't, you weren't kind of ever had, you weren't ever held back on a project that he was working on because he was always ahead with you. You know, you were thinking of a detail and he says, I've got the solution for it. So that was a lot of fun uh, doing that. Uh, uh, maybe the downside of it was, it, of it was that he did too much of, of, of the thinking on the project for you. Uh, uh, you weren't uh, allowed or you, you weren't able to do a lot of uh, free thought on, on John's projects. They were John's projects and you were the extension of his arms to produce his designs. He was a very private and shy person and uh, until you got to know him. And I remember on one particular occasion we were doing a, a presentation for a a building for the city of Saskatoon. It was a wave pool facility. Um, they had interviewed 10 architectural firms in one day, and uh, we happened to be the last firm uh, to be interviewed, and John was the lead presenter uh, on that project, and he was going through his presentation, and uh, uh, we were on one side of the table, the owners were on the other side, and there was a fella sitting down at the end of the table that didn't look like he was paying much attention, so John admonished him for, for not paying attention. Uh, after the pe uh, presentation was over, we kind of walked out, and John says, oh, I'm a silly bastard, aren't I? <laughs> the office was a, it was, a, it was a good place to work. Uh, I think because everybody in the staff believed on, on, on what was happening, the architecture part of it. Uh, yeah, we had, uh, we had great fun. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and these are after hours that we had the fun. Uh, he was an Englishman and uh, was business during nine to five. In fact, one of his favorite ploys with me especially is that he would be out of the office and he'd come at five to five, straight over to my desk. Of course, we'd be discussing the project that I was working on, but uh, he would get an extra half hour, three quarters of an hour out of me. Of course, I'd be too guilty to charge overtime for that. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and and we, we had... Uh, office fishing trips that we went on and we had a lot of fun on those things but it was after hours that we had fun uh, during the uh, office working hours it was strictly business yeah well there's another time when we had our uh, office fishing trip and uh, uh, two occasions actually two interesting ones about the office fishing trips uh, one time we got stranded in a storm we had broken a shear pin on the motor and of course we were, we were busy gathering wood and of course, John's the boss, and he's watching us gather wood. And I think one of the other fellows told him that, uh, you know, John in the wilderness, and we're stranded. We're all three equals here. So John went to fetch some wood, and of course, the stuff that he got was rotten and wet, and that, and of absolutely no use. John wasn't out of his element. Uh, he was a pretty desperate person. Uh, the other thing we did in one of their fishing ships, I'd been out um, uh, fishing, and we all came into the dock the same day. And John had this Rolex watch that he had got from his father and that he coveted quite well. And uh, we were just getting out of the boats and he splashed his 
or dropped his watch into the water. And, uh, and I thought, geez, I got to get that from him. So I, I don't even think I stripped down. I just jumped into the water, dove three or four times. The water was only about 10 feet deep. And finally, I, I grabbed, saw the watch, grabbed it, and I was coming up. And then surfaced, and I realized it was a Timex watch that I just dive for. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he took that off for the day of fishing, wore the Timex. Yeah, John would, uh, as uh, we talked about before, would do his sketches at home, and he'd bring the pad in. And uh, as an example, uh, this is a detail of a, of a bench. Uh, we could literally take that drawing. It's got all the dimensions on it. It's to scale. We could actually transcribe it into a hard line drawing uh, to be part of the working drawings. And John did this with every aspect of the project. Uh, the floor plan, the pattern on the floor plan, uh, the elevations, the sections, even the overall uh, sketch of the building. A 3D massing of the building. He did. Uh, he he sketched it all, and and very accurately, to proportion. He sketched it to proportion, so uh, you didn't uh, end up getting a sketch that didn't work. It with we had to work out details in it, but inevi inevitably it always worked, and that was something that's always amazed me about John. Even today, I, I'm just not capable of doing something like that, and. I was just awestruck at, and still am, at that ability and talent. I don't know whether John would admit it, uh, but I, he was very uh, heavily influenced uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright. I can see a lot of, a lot of the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright influence uh, in John, and uh, as well as Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, his buildings are quite timeless as well. So somehow he he got that connection with Frank Lloyd Wright, and uh, and I don't know how he did it. We were doing a renovation to a school in Lloyd Minster, and it was a gymnasium that was being refurbished. And there was some uh, some wall treatment that John was doing on the wall. It was a series of circles, and uh, it never occurred to me on the time uh, at that time of the Frank Lloyd Wright influence of of, of those circles in that space. Uh, but uh, years later, I I, I, I w visited one of Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings in the states of uh, Moraine County, which was done after that, incidentally after that sketch that John had done. Uh, but uh, uh, there it was. <laughs> you know, it was, it was that uh, uh, series of circles at different scales, and we saw some of those in, in the sketchbook that we were looking at earlier today. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's how Frank Lloyd Wright worked too. He, he, he worked sort of uh, from general to detail. And that's how John worked all this project. He kind of did the general thing. Uh, the original sketches didn't show a lot, but then he filled in the details. Uh, well, has, has Frank Larry Wright falling water? One of his, his uh, most famous uh, uh, houses, in fact, his most famous house, uh, is, has several cantilevers on it. And yes, John had a lot of cantilevers. In fact, in one of the projects uh, in Regina, we, uh, he had one of the cantilevers fail and had to do some work uh, to correct that failure. It was a structural failure on the project. And I know John, although uh, not responsible for the actual workings of the structural failure on that project, lost a lot of sleep and, and uh, over that project because he was the architect of record on it. But he came up with a brilliant solution to solve the problem. I think that's a, another Frank Lloyd Wright connection. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, light was very important to him. And, uh, and and as with John, uh, getting light into a, into the center of a of a large complex, he he put a lot of effort into doing that. Uh, uh, I think the uh, Law Commerce Building, the Law Library, is a good good example of that. He had a very uh, brilliant uh, and brilliant in the sense of bright uh, color palette. Uh, I think back on on some of the projects and, and look at the color schemes and say, how did we ever do these? But they came off. Uh, uh, that's maybe the, the one, well, the one aspect of, of his design that's maybe dated, the color part of it. Uh, you can, uh, the use of the oranges and the browns and that, uh, you, can, you can relate that to the uh, 70s and 80s and that type of thing. That would be the only thing that's, that I would say is, that's not timeless in John's architecture, the colors. Of course, if we wait long enough, it'll come They'll back. come back, they'll come back, yeah. John tended to over-detail things. And I think the stairs were, were something like that. 
Um, there was a lot of different ways that you can uh, treat st stairs, and I think he had a bit of fun with that. Like one, he says, we'll do a minimal stair. What's the minimum, absolute minimum we can build this stair? Minimum amount of material, that type of thing. So I, I think he did uh, have a bit of fun of that. And, and I think that may even come back to his first job out of school in England. He worked for a large firm, and he did stair details, I think, for a year or so. And that completely turned him off in, in, in practicing architecture, involved in architecture. And that's what brought him to Canada, thank, thank God. So I think that was kind of, uh, I'm coming back to, uh, to get back at that stair episode of my life, yeah. And I think he did try to treat uh, stairs with a little delight later on in his career. Yeah, in fact, one of the stairs that he did for uh, uh, Lutheran Seminary in Saskatoon, the engineer didn't know how to design it. And so he, he told me, he says, I just threw a bunch of steel in there, in the concrete, because I couldn't figure out how to design it. And, and that was uh, uh, another thing that John uh, always challenged the consultants on a constant basis. And, uh, uh, and I think he made uh, a lot of the consultants that work with him better consultants because of that. Uh, the stair, the particular one that we were talking about, was, you know, it kind of... Uh, Think of a spiral stair, but as a square, and and of course uh, not a not a, a, a stiff, rigid thing, because the the treads are the things you walk on, the stringers are the thing that hold it up, uh, not all one piece, but separate little elements. So he had to, the engineer had to tie those things together. John uh, actually did a lot of structural design as he was designing. Uh, that's how you were trained in England. Uh, and actually, a lot of the buildings he did, he did all the structural design on them, uh, you know, uh, on single-story buildings and that. He did a lot of the structural design, so uh, he knew what he was talking about when he talked to the engineers and had a good sense of what was capable. He, he lost a lot of clients because they thought his architecture was too modern. They weren't comfortable with that. Uh, they, they looked at his architecture as modern rather than traditional. And uh, I know... Uh, um, I was uh, uh, talking to uh, uh, someone a couple of months ago, and that's exactly what they said. We were going to get John to design us a house, but he's just too modern. The visual presentation that we did at the AGM, uh, actually one of our former clients came to the table and said, John, you really were good. Uh, so that's amongst our even our architectural community. Uh, some of them didn't realize the, uh, uh, the work that he had uh, accomplished over his professional career. And, and certainly he wasn't a, a, a PR fellow by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he was, it was architecture and that was his focus. He once told me that his goal was to be the, the best architect in Saskatoon. Uh, I, I think he, he, he accomplished that goal. And, and uh, in fact, there's two architects in, in the province that I think are equally as, as good as John and Clifford Weems. And, so yeah, he, he has suffered from a uh, lack of recognition. Uh, I, I don't think I'll ever be able to divorce myself from John Stile. Uh, as architects, uh, you, uh, as you're going to school, uh, you seem to pick an architect that you like and, and, and emulate that architect, whether that's for, uh, with, just because of lack of confidence or whatever it is. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, till the day I die, I will be influenced by John Holiday Scott. It's as simple as that. Uh, I did a, a renovation house for a friend of mine uh, who was related to a previous client of John's who came to visit his house. He says, did John Holiday Scott design this? <laughs> so you, you, uh, you, you effectively uh, uh, gain some of that personality that, that uh, you know, I've working with them uh, for that uh, long period of time. I, I think the, to me, the most important thing is the dedication to the profession uh, that, I, that I learned from John. And uh, I, I can't get away from that. And uh, John and I have lunch quite often. Uh, we're still good friends. And uh, he, he says that that person that was an architect is a different person than he is today. But we inevitably spend the two hours in that lunch talking about architecture. So uh, although he says that it's left him, it hasn't left him. 
uh, maybe one thing that I haven't mentioned that it, is that uh, I'm not the only one that he inspired. There were several uh, people that worked in the office that went on to become architects, and I think it was uh, through John's inspiration that that happened. So I, other outside the architecture, I think a great comp contribution that he played to the profession was the inspiration uh, or how he inspired people to go on further and become architects. Where were you growing up in England? What, was it countryside? Well, it was just on the edge of the green belt around London. Um, we were, in fact, you know, country right outside the, the back door, but it was, we were only, a, I don't know, a dozen miles from Hyde Park Corner you know, on the main line. The original suburb called Surbiton. I don't, and you know, I don't really know why it was that uh, that I wanted to be an architect, but but I was quite young when when I, when I you know decided that's what I wanted to be. I think it was about fourteen or fifteen, and uh, until I uh, you know until I uh, the equivalent of, of high school graduation when I was eighteen. Um, I had managed to take as an optional subject, uh, you know, a study of architecture. So by the time I got into uh, into architecture school proper, I'd, I'd already read a, a fair amount, um, you know, visited all the uh, all the prominent local buildings. So it gave me a good start. I like the. St the stuff that I, I guess would be kind of like New Empire stuff, uh, Lutyens and Voisey, you know. Uh, uh, just by um, happenstance, working in, uh, in one architect's office during school holidays, uh, we got to work on, a, on um, a house that was being built in in the garden of uh, of a Lutyens house in Guildford. So that you know that was kind of kind of neat. Not not that you could possibly compete in scale and grandeur. I get, you couldn't do it. You couldn't compete with it even now. But uh, but it was uh, you know it was one of those things that felt you felt there was a kind of a continuity there. It's a style that's certainly not. Uh, not much in favour these days, but um, uh, Lutyens, for instance, did um, buildings for the, the for government of India in New Delhi. You know, it, it's kind of uh, uh, classical, with without uh, without moulding. You know. <laughs> um, But it, he does have a, a sense, or did have a sensitivity for, for materials, particularly uh, domestic stuff, which, you know, done in, in brick, very elaborate brickwork, you know, patterned, uh, patterned brick, uh, very prominent chimneys, um, steep roofs usually, lots of gables. It's. Um, it's not anything that I would imitate or had have imitated. Uh, it, it was just something that appealed to me as you know, as a, as a kid. How did you make the shift to architecture over time? Where, where did that happen? Do you know? Well, that happened very easily because um, uh, the all the all the books on architecture that you would read. Um, were kind of caught in in this uh, uh, almost kind of <laughs> religious feeling of, of you know of the, uh, the the kind of moral background of architecture as as as, as being you know like uh, towards a new architecture. It was a feeling that there was. Uh, a moral requirement that you that the building should be as honest and straightforward as it possibly could be, and of course I I grew up in the immediate aftermath of uh, of the Second World War, which uh, in Britain at least 
was a period of, uh, of rationing, of shortages, and of making the best use of, of, uh, of the resources available. So uh, just as, as we grew up uh, thinking that it was immoral to leave food on your plate, so was it immoral to waste resources on, uh, on building. So you, you made the very best of, uh, of what you could afford, you know, uh, which was not only money, but it was in the resources available. Um, went to Kingston uh, School of Architecture for five and a half years, graduated or started in uh, 1951, graduated at the end of 56. Um, we took external RIBA um, final exam um, with a thesis on on the markets in the south of England. And uh, soon after, I worked for a year in, uh, in central London for Traherne, Norman Preston and Partners, where I worked exclusively on large office buildings. This building that, uh, that I was telling you about that uh, we had, were doing toilets and, uh, and lions, corner houses, just tea shop kind of thing. Um, an entry and, you know, elevator lobby and all that kind of stuff, doing a little bit at a time, you know, so, so you, you didn't feel that you were kind of designing the, the thing as a complete parcel, you were, you were just doing an item, then going on to another item, and maybe the fellow next door to you would be given the bit, so any thought of design continuity wasn't, wasn't really there. But that's, uh, that's the way that corporate architecture is practiced. You never got a, a, a complete a sense of a complete building. You were doing bits and pieces as, as you were allocated. The office was a fairly large one. I think there were probably uh, um, two or three offices that, that the firm had and, and there were maybe about 30 people um, working in my little group. I recall doing, um, knowing nothing about one project, and uh, and uh, the uh, the head head uh, draftsman dropping on my desk. Um, uh, first of all, uh, they want they wanted uh, some gates to to this project. I think it was an arrow factory. Um, Cluett Peabody, Cluett Peabody, who makes arrow shirts. Um, had to do uh, had to do gates for this thing, you know, wrought iron gates, and then it was doing logos for something or other, and 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 you'd do it, hand it over, and they'd disappear into into the murk, you know. You you wouldn't if they liked them, you wouldn't see them again. If they didn't, they'd come back, and and the outside, as much as you can, reflects what the what the inside is, you know the. They should fit together, and sometimes in, in buildings they don't. A lot of buildings have no interior. You know, it's um, uh, they're built there. They're uh, it's like the worst kind of motel where you've got a corridor and similar rooms off of it. Well, you know, then it's hard to you know to to kind of feel that as a complete building. You. Um, you like to think to yourself that uh, that you don't respond to just a statement. If you ask somebody to um, to make a statement or or to write down what's important, they'll often give you a, a kind of an off the cuff thing, as you're getting from me, that uh, that that's a kind of aversion. Um, but maybe, maybe not the whole truth. You you almost have to um, have to spend time with with a client. Um, look at faci other facilities that have been built for you know similar needs, and before getting much of a feel of you know of of how to respond. 
but it's it's well worth doing spending time with a with a client because uh, I think you serve them you serve a client better by responding to um, uh, to a need which you understand rather than one that uh, you know that he gives you off the cuff like a zealous store that moved into the old uh, Walmart. Um, it, it looks like they purposely did that in, in the ugliest way they possibly could. Uh, I, and I'd say they, they pretty well succeeded. We had a, we had a client, um, the, a chain of, uh, of, uh, of clothing stores, And they showed us their stores and said, uh, OK, go ahead, do it. So we produced uh, as uh, sophisticated a design as we could for the, uh, for the budget available. And uh, they looked at it and said, yeah, that, that's, that's very nice, but you've misunderstood us, lads. What we want is something that looks cheap and nasty so that people think they're getting a bargain when they shop here. So, and that's the kind of philosophy that's uh, understandable, but not, not really very sympathetic to good design. And, you know, I, I feel that maybe that's, uh, that's uh, a philosophy that many retailers adopt. And to, to create something which is as close to being a nothing or, or even positively ugly, I, I think, <laughs> is, is, is certainly not what any designer would strive for. Every architect designs primarily for himself, really. You know, it's, it, it's only your own taste that uh, that you're ultimately going to uh, kind of rely on. If you have a, a sympathetic client or a, a, a client who can, who can uh, kind of uh, lead you, um, you're very lucky. If you want a client that only wants uh, the negative, maybe you, maybe you just have to bear it. Um, you know, being honest, uh, that those particular um, stores that we did, uh, I think we did two of these uh, sand stores. Um, design quality was not the object, and you know, certainly <laughs> if, if it was, it wasn't achieved. There are always good architects around who can make a, who can make out of unpromising material a, a you know an admirable result. Um, but for, for many of us, um, uh, the ability to turn, uh, you know, sow's ears into silk purses is, is not, uh, you know, it's not a universal one. And for most people, uh, you almost long for a, a period like uh, the Georgian period, where you find very few bad buildings because there was an understanding of, uh, of, of, uh, of things in proportion. Everybody agreed uh, you know that uh, that, a, that good geometry, you know, of, uh, of golden section, uh, s straight geometric forms, rectangular lines, contributed to uh, to dignity in a building. And you might feel that uh, that there was less variety in those buildings, but if you go to a, a, a place like uh, Bath in England or Edinburgh, in Scotland. You can see the benefit of, of having a common design philosophy amongst all the people practicing at a certain time. And, and that certainly isn't true here. Maybe it's never been true um, here. Well, uh, yeah, and, and including Frank Gehry's buildings, uh, what I was saying about the ability of some people of genius to uh, 
you know, to, to create things which other people can't, um, applies. Um, his kind of building should be left to his individuality and, and doesn't have general application. It isn't something everybody should be trying to copy? No, which happens. no. No, it, it, it may seem willful, maybe, um, because it, it would hard to be hard to uh, kind of describe the building in, in, in kind of using logical terms or explain it as, as a kind of a straightforward system because uh, it's, it's a very individual approach. We're fantastically lucky to uh, to practice in a in a place like uh, like Saskatoon, because um, we've had the opportunity to do almost any type of building you can imagine, um, and do the entire project with with uh, very little design um, kind of, uh, of people sitting on you saying. No, I know what I like, and what I like is what I'm going to get. Um, corporate clients here have been have been great, you know. Well, particularly at the university. Well, that. I liked doing the uh, the airport in Saskatoon. Um, there's almost nothing recognisable left of, of that anymore. But uh, that, that was again in the, in the period when uh, when I was kind of interested in using uh, precast concrete elements and expressing them and you know that uh, so that that building looked a little bit like an erector set kind of design but i i i was quite pleased with it um also might mention um uh, pretty well the last building I did was for Sastel in, um, in North Battleford. And, and they, were, they were a pretty good client too, I think. You know, the old story about, um, about any work of art being 99% perspiration, I'm sure is, is true. Um, people can't say where, where inspiration comes from. Um, or if they do, they're they're more creative in, uh, <laughs> in in words or thought than than they are in uh, in design. Most most times, the design process is thinking, uh, what if we did this? You know, and you, you try that out. That that uh, if that works, then you maybe take it a little further and. But, uh, but the design process isn't, isn't one where you get uh, a magnificent idea and then carry it through with no diversions. Well, it's not for me, and I don't know anybody that it is true for. I see a building that I do as, uh, have done as something that's going to occupy a good bit of my professional career, you know, of time in that, and 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 I don't want it to be, you know, kind of an ordinary um, thing that just provides income, you know, it, it, uh, without thinking of it as being a kind of a legacy. You think of it as being something. If it was worthwhile doing, it should be something that had individuality and and uh, and visual appeal you know